What you are looking at right now is a fluid simulation I've been working on. This is one of many, and you can tell that it is particle-based, which is what I'm gonna be showing you today. Fluid particle dynamics, which on the uh, spectrum of physics tutorials is kinda on this end, the hard end. This is the hard end. Uh, this is the uh, easy end. We are basically going to simulate a lot of dots that together act like a fluid. In geometry nodes, I'm going to delete everything and make my geometry nodes object. First thing we need is we are going to simulate a single point and then we are going to take it from there. I'm going to start with a single point. I'm going to move it up on the z-axis and I want you to imagine that there's kind of like a magical box over here that this fluid is contained in, meaning it can't go under here or to the left or to the uh, right, which means that the Z component is bounded at Z equals zero and we'll say X is equal to negative one and one. I'm going to add in gravity using simulation zones. Every frame, move it a little down on the Z axis, which when we play this, uh, you know, kind of kind of has gravity in a sense. It's moving downwards. Issue with this, if you classify it as an issue, is that it has a constant velocity, meaning it kind of doesn't speed up or slow down, which is true in the sense of inertia. If an object is not acted on by a force, it will keep its velocity. However, we have the force due to gravity, meaning that this should be accelerating. It should start with a velocity of zero, and then it should move a little, and then it should move in, uh, even more and more, and it's going to gain speed. Instead, what I want to do is I want to make a variable. I'm gonna call this V for velocity. This is our shorthand. We're gonna say that V, a little counterintuitively, is equal to V. We add this vector math and we say, take the velocity and add a bit of a negative component. In other words, on every frame, our velocity is going to be updated by moving even more downwards. I'll make a copy of this, is gonna be offset by the velocity vector. When we play this, you can see, if you have a keen eye, that this looks uh, more realistic. So this is the approach we're gonna be taking. We are going to update our velocity, and then once we have our velocity, we are going to move our object. Now, something like this is kind of called Euler integration. Basically what it means is every single frame, we're gonna calculate all our forces and friction and gravity. However, a little, again, counterintuitively, if you just use this approach, every tiny bit of error, let's say it's just 0.1% off the velocity. Every time you do this, that uh, error is going to compound and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's because we're, we're not adding any kind of numerical stability. Ability. If there is no force and this is our velocity vector, every single frame, it's going to have the uh, same velocity. We can use this conservation of inertia to actually add stability, where we say every velocity update should kind of be dependent on the previous one. Instead of being its whole new thing, take the old calculation and update it a bit. Basically, the idea is this velocity is going to be calculated using new and uh, old positions where it is minus what I'm going to call the old position. And we're going to define this variable in a bit. This is going to be our position update relative to the velocity. This is where we're doing our velocity calculation. We then uh, store this old position. We do our update and uh, then we compare. So it's kind of like a Ouroboros, kind of like a, a loop here. Now, when I play this, something very counterintuitive happens. And I'm actually wondering what's going on myself. It seems to be doing this, but it's moving upwards, which doesn't vibe with our idea of gravity. I think this is because our old position is not defined, question mark. We are just gonna give it the old uh, position, which we are going to define right here. So let's see what that looks like. There we go. One thing that I'm noticing immediately is that it's falling uh, through our boundary. Again, I said Z is equal to zero uh, should be the minimum. When we update our position, it turns out that that is not enough. We need to take the position. We're going to take this vector and we are going to apply a maximum where a Z should be equal to zero and this can be negative whatever. I think the thing we're missing here is we have a bit of offset, which we don't want. So now gravity is applied and it can't go uh, further. Once this kind of reaches the bottom, we could just have it behave like this where it just kind of stops or we can have this act more like a basketball where it then shoots back upwards. It's velocity 
uh, gets inverted. So after we define our velocity, again, I'm gonna do this in separate parts. If the Z coordinate is equal to zero, in other words, what happened is we did our constraint. So if Z is equal to zero, what we wanna say is update the velocity by flipping its Z component, right? So if it's going like this, it should now flip. And I want to say, we wanna reassign this to velocity such that the Z component is maintained, or no, the Z component is flipped, uh, but the X component is maintained. But let's see what this looks like. Okay, it's bouncing. One thing you might be noticing, by the way, is that for free, we kind of get this velocity dampening. So you'd expect this to fall and then kind of go all the way back up here and then fall like losing no energy. I guess we're calculating it based on a uh, how close it is to zero. So if it's here and then is mapped to here, that's gonna be a smaller vector that's eventually going to be flipped. That is going to be a smaller vector than if we started up here, uh, which no, isn't exactly physically accurate, but I don't care. Um, in fact, we could actually take this negative component and half it. So on top of this dampening that we have, we can have it be even more dampening. I want to say that this should bounce off of the negative one and X is equal to one walls. This cannot be smaller than negative one because it's going to take the maximum. And then we also want to take the minimum is this a confusing tutorial? Yes. So I think a good way to test to see if this is working is we can actually uh, take our position and move it here. And you see it's actually not going past this invisible wall. Kind of update our lines to be more representative. You can see I can't move it past this wall and same for this wall. Now, uh, the other thing I want to do is I want to do a velocity update where if it is going to this wall, I want it to kind of reflect. We just need to flip the X component. It's still gonna be going down. What we wanna do is we wanna look at the X component. So this is just gonna be a bit of a trick. Take the absolute value. What is he thinking? We wanna check if this is greater than or equal to one. If this is the X component is larger than one, which means it's outside the bounds like a 1.5, not only is it gonna be mapped here, but it's going to be detected by this because this is gonna be equal to one. And then the same over here, we take the uh, absolute value, which maps it over here, and it should work. So under this constraint, we are gonna do something very similar, except this time we are gonna multiply the X component. Let's do negative 0.5 just like before. Because it's just falling downwards, I wanna test like sending it this way. Add a bit of velocity on the X axis, but only do that on the first frame. When frame, and this is like the uh, time frame is equal to zero. Give it a bit of X velocity. I think I've been silly yet again. Uh, our sequence turns out starts at frame one, not zero. I'm hoping that's the fix. I haven't tested that. There we go, boys. Of course, uh, one thing you'll see in a second is that we're missing a uh, friction. So for friction, uh, we could do something kind of fancy where we're saying if you're touching the ground and kind of reduce your velocity, or we can just say apply friction everywhere. Doesn't matter where you are on every single frame. It's not as accurate, but then we also get some air resistance and some other things. We're gonna take our velocity and for every selection, in other words, for everything, we are going to take our velocity. We are going to scale it on X, Y, and Z. It needs to be smaller than one. So if it's like 0.9, it loses 10% of its momentum in some sense. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, so, so that's definitely too much friction. Let's try killing 2% and you can just keep testing with this. Let's initialize a bunch of points. So I'm gonna use a mesh line and I guess we want to only keep the points. So we're gonna do mesh to points. Let's actually only have like two of these for now. You can see they're both behaving with gravity and in fact, bouncing a bit differently again, because how we're doing this calculation. Uh, one thing I'm noticing though, this is the point I'm making. They kind of just pass through each other. If we're making our fluid made out of particles, all these H2O molecules shouldn't be able to like intersect. And this is where we're getting pretty much to the last part, which is collision detection relative to each other. I want you to imagine that each of these points has their own radius. In fact, by this radius number, so we can actually change that radius. We know that these are intersect if and only if that these circles are overlapping, right? Uh, the question is, 
how do we act accordingly? The way we avoid a collision is let's think, these are overlapping. How do we make them not overlap? We just push them apart. So you could either move like this bottom particle downwards so that they're barely touching. And by barely touching, I mean now they're kind of like this. Or what would again add more stability is I'm gonna look at the center point and I'm gonna move each one of these half of the way. If we look at both of these points or any two points, they have a distance. Under what condition are they like pretty much colliding? Well, if they're like kissing, like touching, the distance is this, which you can see is actually equal to this radius of the circle times two. In other words, if this distance is bigger than two times the radius as it is here, they're not colliding. And if it is smaller, they are colliding. What I'm going to do, and this is kind of like a shortcut, I'm gonna use the index of nearest node. It's gonna tell us which point is the closest to it other than itself. If we had a third point over here, it's gonna ignore it because even if there are three particles colliding, the one we wanna handle first is probably the closest one. I want to evaluate its position, and then I wanna know the distance between them. So the distance between the original position and the position of the nearest which we can just calculate for. Now, how do we know if it's less than two times the radius? Well, we actually have a uh, field. So I'm going to take this radius and multiply by two, and I want to subtract one from another. If this is less than zero, that means that two times the radius is greater than the distance. Under this condition that a, a particle is within some distance of the thing, I wanna shove it halfway from the intersection point. Specifically, it's our, if this is our original particle and this is our new particle, this is some great notation. If this is our original particle and new particle, we want the vector from the one we're comparing it to, to the original, because that will push it in the correct direction. We don't want to move it even deeper into the intersection. In other words, I want to calculate the position minus the position of the nearest. And then the question is, how much should we push, right? So by what amount should we scale? I'm thinking that should just be two times the radius minus the distance, which should be a positive number and divide that by two. Well, uh, because we have the opposite, we have the distance minus two times the radius, we want to divide by two and also flip it. So I'm thinking let's just divide by negative two. And I'm saying that is how much we should offset it by. So what I've done is I've made a bunch of points in kind of this like diagonal line. Let me like shift this over so that none of them are being constrained. And let's see what happens. So they're all bouncing, they're falling, and yeah, it does seem like they're making an effort to not touch, right? Otherwise they would be overlapping. I wanna up the ante, so I'm gonna make it 15 by 15. And because these are like kind of intersecting, I mean, they're definitely intersecting, I then want to uh, move the radius downwards and let's see how uh, this reacts. So we've upped the ante. Okay, so you can see uh, towards the end, they're making an effort to separate, uh, but you can see th th they just can't. What we wanna do is we wanna take our, I'm gonna call it our uh, constraints. So I'm actually going to separate this velocity update section. So I don't need any of that. We have the bounding box constraint and the collision detection constraint. I want to do those more often. And instead of putting them inside their own simulation zone, which wouldn't work because we only get one update per frame, we wanna do updates within a frame. So somehow like subframes. Well, that is what the repeat zone's for. It's basically like a loop. So all we've done is we've taken our like update and wove it through a repeat zone. But uh, with the repeat zone, we can actually up our collision check. So let's do it four times. And then it's gonna do four rounds of this like intersection thing, which you can see, I think they're spreading out a bit faster. Let's actually bump it up to 20 times. And this is why we did it the way we did. So yeah, now you can see they're like bouncing a bit more and we have this property where some particles are sitting on top of each other. But not only do we need more sub-steps, but it would also be useful to take more steps. Well, all we need to do is we need to take our velocity updates and make them smaller. Initially, we're giving it a velocity 0.1. Let me just divide this by four. So initially, it will move much slower and you can see it's actually behaving differently. Also, gravity seems to be a bit too strong. So I'm gonna make gravity four times smaller. Let's see what this looks like. So now gravity isn't as crazy and look at that. And to actually see the simulation and what I would consider more real time is let's up the frame rate. So when we play it back, 
kind of looks like it's a real-time simulation. I'm going to quadruple it by doubling on both the X and Y axis. I think I also need to divide by two on the radius. But something I'm sure you've seen at this point that I don't personally like is that it seems like all the particles kind of tend towards the bottom. I think what we can do is we can take this like Z bounce. Remember we said under the condition that Z is, you know, equal to zero, updated by this much. Well, let's just bounce it by negative one instead of fully dampening it. Now, another thing I wanna do is I don't want all these particles to exist in the beginning because I think that will take a lot of steps and sub steps. For our initialization, I'm gonna get rid of all of this and instead I'm gonna have it spawn particles. What we can do is we can take a mesh line and then on every frame, we can join everything we've done uh, with this mesh line, which initially, and let's also make sure to do a mesh to points, store the old position and click play. And <laughs> it is a disaster, <laughs> but you know, at least the particles are separating. That is crazy. Let's move this over to the side, which again, will create the same kind of issue. And I think the reason for that is just as like some of these particles are moving, more of them get spawned on top of that. I think what we are to do is we are to join these, but only every once in a while. So what we can do is we can add a switch where we're gonna say you can join them or you could not. So sometimes it's gonna bypass the join. We look at the frame number and we can divide it by let's say three. So on frame one, it will be a third, two thirds, one, cause it's three over three, et cetera. And I only wanna keep the integers. So three over three, six over three. So what I can do is I can take the ceiling function, you'll see, and what I want to do is I wanna check, are these equal? Might not be the fastest way to do this. I know there's modulo and all this, but this is the way I'm doing it. But every third frame will be an integer, which means that the ceiling function is equal to itself. I connect it to the switch. This time we will actually connect it to the switch and see if anything changes. Oh yes, <laughs> now it is uh, just moving upwards. And I think that's because we're not giving it any initial velocity. Well, when the particles are just born, they're age one, then I want to do it. So when we spawn these particles and we store their old position, I also want to store, I guess it would be an integer. I want to store its frame number, which you can think of as its age. Some of these get frame 45, some of them get 39, and it should be multiples of three. And what I wanna do is I want to do this initial condition, this velocity thing, not when the frame is equal to the thing, uh, but instead when it is equal to our named attribute, so age. And there you go. Okay, we have initial velocity. This seems, much more stable. So once we're at this step, what we can do, by the way, I should just call this sim for simulation. Uh, we can go to simulation nodes and start baking it, which will calculate much faster than just playing it normally. So you can see it's blasting. Kind of the next things to do is one, kind of get rid of this boundary condition thing, but also to make the particles smaller so it looks less like a bunch of dots, which of course it is, we need to clear our simulation because no matter what we do, it's gonna play the previous one. Now that we've done that, we can take the offset and divide by two. So now they're gonna be packed together, which will make this explode Explosion. Correspondingly, we're gonna divide the radius by two. Yeah, it's kind of like slowing down really quickly. And it, you know, if I had to guess, I think it's because of the friction. Remember, this friction really affects stuff. So it's losing 2% on every frame. And especially since we have more frames, that's gonna happen more uh, frequently. Interestingly, you'll see in a second, we're starting to get these like eddies, these like spinning behaviors that you are kind of like used to from fluids. Just a bit of a cheap, kind of correction uh, for these like walls is yes, we can change the simulation settings, yada, yada, yada. I think a quick way we can do this just to make sure is at the very end of the simulation, and yes, this is a bit of cheating, is we can delete certain points. We wanna look where the absolute value is equal to one and delete those, that will get rid of that. So here's before and after. Additionally, you can also do the same thing with the bottom layer if you don't like it. So we wanna see where the Z component, I guess, is exactly uh, equal to zero. So there is the before and after. Initial velocity is way too high, so it's kind of hard to fight against the force of this current, which is also realistic under that condition. But because that current is too strong, I'm just gonna make it less strong. This is the final result. I've not looked at it. Maybe it needs more refinement, but let's find out what we got. Okay. I like that I reduced the fr okay. <laughs> uh, maybe it's a bit too much. It, let, let me just add velocity. We're gonna do one more. Take two, still haven't seen it. Uh, hopefully it is better this, I, I don't even remember what I changed. Here we go. 
Okay, starting off good. Some, some, you know, maybe a little too much velocity. I'm pretty impressed for something we did in like an hour. I mean, I don't, ooh, look at those eddies. If that's not a fluid, I don't know what is. If you wanna get the best fluid simulation blend file to have ever existed that you can play with and make three dimensional, in which case you just get rid of the whole Y axis uh, equal to zero thing, you can get that on my Patreon. There's literally nothing better you can do with your money. It's impossible. My Patreon is it, the peak. Thank you for watching. I'm sure you learned something. So hopefully you take that with you.